Welcome to the final episode of our Numenera series with Darcy Ross. Before we get to the episode, some announcements as usual. As a reminder, the next two weeks we'll be taking some time off and there will be no Character Evolution cast episodes for the rest of the month. Uh, we are still recording series when we can and planning content um, and we will be releasing those series at our normal cadence, uh, usually the first Monday of every month uh, and then the next two Mondays after that. Uh, so stay tuned for all of the exciting stuff that we have planned, hopefully uh, very soon. Not our fault that June had five Mondays. I know. How dare. Time, how dare. <laughs> <laughs> you can still use the promotional code that we announced at the start of this series at the Monty Cook Game Store. The code CCC5OFF, all lowercase, the numeral five, will get you $5 off at the MCG store. Please go take a look at what they have and maybe get yourself something nice. Yeah, they got a lot of nice things, so uh, pretty much... <laughs> anything will get you something nice yeah pretty much <laughs> mm -hmm. uh well one thing that we'd love to do when amelia and i can sit down for these cold opens together is read reviews uh we only have a couple left in our little box of reviews uh so any more reviews you want to send our way uh we would be really 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 happy about that um you can leave us a review on pod chaser if apple podcasts is uh a little too cumbersome, which we know it is. It is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we were checking Podcast Addict now as well, um, and a few other places. So, uh, like this one, this one came from Facebook. Uh, this was a review from Daryl Holiday the second, um, and they say, "Amazing cast and guests. As a new developer, I learned so much, and as a tabletop fan, I love the short journey through each new system." Well, thank you, Daryl. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very nice. With all that out of the way, here's the episode. Yeah, enjoy. discussion episode. Last time we created characters for Numenera. This episode we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Darcy Ross. Do you want to go ahead and reintroduce yourself and uh, tell everyone a little bit about the character that you made? Oh yes. Uh, so hello everybody. I'm Darcy Ross. I use she her pronouns and I work for Monty Cook Games as their community relations coordinator. I'm also a snailologist by training and a uh, weird uh, gamer uh, and lover of all types of games. So uh, Numenera is my favorite RPG. It's the RPG that got me GMing for the first time. And I've been GMing mostly Numenera for a long time now. And so I haven't gotten to make a character in a while. So the character I made was uh, Jiren Deft. They are a nurturing right who crafts illusions. And so they are uh, sort of nurturing in personality. They're a right, which means they uh, do a lot to like craft Numenera from um, salvaged parts like Iodum. And uh, they craft illusions. So they are uh, adept at uh, some strange um, either technology or magic-like ability that lets them uh, create like a big, cool, moving illusion uh, complete with sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, their background is that uh, they've got um, uh, their two friends who you're about to meet from our other, uh, your wonderful hosts, uh, are very helpful for helping me like craft illusions. We work really well as a team. Um, I am a childhood friend of uh, Ryan's character, uh, who is Selena, Selena Lightfoot. And uh, I am close friends and, like, have worked in a tailor shop with Amelia's character, uh, Ursula. And so we are a tight team. I have uh, – we do adventuring together. I have a weird oddity that helps stains get removed from my clothing, so I'm very neat. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we still – 
must venture out for the wonders of the ninth world. And so uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty adept there too. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Amelia, how about your character? Uh, my character is Ursula, who is a prepared nano who howls at the moon. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I think I decided between the last episode and this one that my uh, lycanthropic form is um, a, a really big, scary looking bear. Oh, Ooh. cool. Um, we can decide what else we want to do with that. I Heck yeah. As we go through it. But I think I think it's like a bear kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like Darcy said, I we worked at this tailor shop together. Um, I do have a wand that keeps away insects, which I'm pretty excited about. <laughs> um, I think that is like I I feel like the the oddities that we got are like super useful things that I would love to have in real life. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I love our little group. I'm oh, I'm so excited about this. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Ryan, you want to tell us about your character? Yeah, my character, uh, Celine Lightfoot, she, her pronouns. Uh, S- Celine is a serene delve who moves like a cat. Uh, so Celine uh, kind of got her start uh, teaching children all about ancient archaeology throughout the world. Um, and uh, met some uh, good friends in a distant city at one point. I'm sure that won't uh, complicate things at all in any sort of adventure. <laughs> um, and uh, they are childhood friends with uh, Jiren. Uh, and we grew up probably since early childhood, if not uh, neighbor kids or something like that. Yeah. Um, so we go back a long ways, and... I think that connection uh, allowed me to connect uh, pretty quickly with uh, Ursula as well, mm. uh, who has been working uh, quite closely with them. Um, and I, I kind of went out adventuring for a while, exploring, and finally came back after a series of strange occurrences kind mm. of led me right back to uh, the other characters. Uh, and the current situation that we're we're gonna hopefully find ourselves in. <laughs> this is very good. This is a very good group of people. I know. It's very uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive into our discussion segment that we call D twenty for your thoughts. D twenty for your thoughts. All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. We like to take time to get to know our guests, so can you tell us a little bit about how you got into RPGs and how you ended up doing what you're doing now? Absolutely. So uh, when I was a kid, I was a big, you know, fantasy reader. I would read anything with like a fantasy look on the title, (laughs) just like absolute (laughs) inhaled any sort of fantasy trashy material I could get my hands on Um, and played a lot of video games in that vein too. And I think just through being really in um, sort of fantasy genres, I've heard, I had heard about d d It was this mm. mysterious, you know, game. I was doing some like freeform role play on weird forums, but I had never gotten to like play Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. And so um, I eventually got a player's guide of probably like third edition and uh, studied it like some arcane tome that, uh, because it doesn't actually tell you how to play the game or run a Dungeons and Dragons game, as I'm sure many of you now know, but I, Mm -hmm. a child, did not. And so I tried to infer, based on this character creation book, how a game would run. And I like knew there were maps. That was about as far as I got. So (laughs) at one point, my younger sister was having a sleepover with a friend, and I made a little graph paper map and accosted them and made two characters for them, a ranger and a wizard, Mm. and made them dungeon delve with me and my absolute vague understanding of the rules. (laughs) And so that was how I got my start. Ever since then, I've been, you know, I spent a lot of years like trying to find a group or find people with the knowledge to run RPGs. Like, it, you know, it was really tough um, in kind of the days before it was as easy as it is now on the internet to like find a group to teach you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I started playing a lot in grad school and I got really into like lots of indie RPGs and learning about all these different systems from Google Plus. And um, then I went to one fateful Gen Con that had uh, Monty Cook's Numenera at it. And I got to play this weird science fantasy game by a guy who I, I knew from the really rich, weird setting of Planescape. And uh, this this setting of Numenera captured me. The 
um, the mechanics and how empowered I felt as a player um, absolutely captured me. And so I knew no one would run Numenera for me, so I had to learn to GM. Mm -hmm. Um, Since then, I've been a GM at a lot of cons and running demos at stores and uh, worked with Contessa to support other marginalized gamers uh, picking up the mantle of GM. And uh, while I was in grad school, uh, MCG, Monte Cook Games, had an opening for a community manager. And so uh, I switched gears from my the, down in the snail pits <laughs> and uh, became community manager for Monte Cook Games. So I still love playing lots of different games, but my heart is still rooted in Numenera. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely uh, series of events that led you to where you are. Yeah, kind of wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, can you tell us about your personal process uh, for picking and creating a character in any role-playing system? I think there's kind of two levels to it. Uh, The first is um, I find I learn so much about how I would want to make a character through play. You know, it's sort of a chicken and an egg problem, right? Like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my character creation is enhanced by having played before having play like playing is enhanced by having gone through the process of character creation. So both of them feed by each other. But often what I do is if it's a one shot, I might grab a pre-gen because I like to see how the designers of the game make a character. And I find that kind of fun to look at. Mm. Um, But when I go to actually pick out my character options for myself, I really like to play off of other players. I find that's like a really used we sort of did that in our character creation too right there was a little back and forth about like oh you have this ability i could take this ability and that would be a fun like dynamic for our characters Mm -hmm. so i find i'm often i enjoy responding to the characters around me and building a character that can like highlight the cool strengths of others or like push against them in an interesting way or be a foil right like um i like i i use that a lot um the other thing is like I usually just try to find like the juiciest weird ability or like mm. what's a strange narrative thing I can do, right? Um, I don't enjoy optimizing for like mechanical combos very well. Like I would really, I like, I would rather have a mechanically useless but narratively interesting weird thing that I could do. Yeah. So <laughs> often I'm like searching through books to look for that kind of juicy bit. I, I like, mm-hmm. I'm absolute flavor over <laughs> substance <laughs> <laughs> and it bites me. Uh, so I don't necessarily, Same. you know, fully endorse it, but that's what I do. <laughs> that's awesome. Have your own kind of fun, whatever that it, is. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There's no wrong way to play as long as we're all doing okay and having fun. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, how do you think character creation in this game stacks up with other systems that you've played? Gosh, yeah, it is a uh, one of the sweet spots for me is feeling like I have a lot of choice um, and flexibility without overwhelming me by being like having no guide rails. Right. And so um, I think one of the ways that Numenera's character creation system really works for me is that it has a lot of options, but it has lots of rooms for room for like. Um, riffing off of things or changing the flavor of things. There's a lot of like narrative um, uh, customization that I can still do with my character. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that's uh, different, you know, Numenera often gets lumped in with like, uh, like indie games. And I think the character creation process is a little involved because there is a lot of like stuff, right? Like Numenera has... um, be- because it, so many of its abilities are really unique and different, they don't follow a template. And so it does mean like when I'm looking at the abilities that my right has, um, they look very different than like the tier information you'll find in um, Amelia's Nano, right? Like I've got some stuff about weird this weird character creation subsystem that I've built a ca- I've picked a character that wants to engage with, so I get some perks. So they don't map onto each other very well, which is definitely fun, but takes some time to kind of like get your footing around. Mm-hmm. Well, I noticed like we were going through and Ryan's picking his skills and I'm looking at my thing and I'm like, it doesn't say skills anywhere in yes. here. Do I not have skills? What, right. What are these esoteries? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of asymmetries in the characters and um, I think that is a perk, but it makes character creation kind of like you know, exciting, but slower, right? Because we're not mm-hmm. all following the same template. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. One of the things, uh, you know, I think about like, Numenera thinks a lot about like, what do you do in the world? Like, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be the really explorey type? Are you going to be the really speaky type? Um, so 
I don't know. I feel like types map closest onto like kind of playbooks if people are thinking about PBTA games. Mm -hmm. Um, But it, you know, playbooks are really, here is the menu. It is on this one or two pages. Uh, You circle things on this menu and then you're ready to play. I think that's really cool. And I I almost wonder if there's not like a Numenera hack where you could Mm -hmm. make playbooks for Numenera, right? Oh, Um, yeah, easily, yeah. But uh, but there's uh, it it is more like D and D than, you know, it, like D and D third edition or something where you're like looking for weird feats and uh, mm-hmm. your equipment really matters because you get weird stuff like your ciphers do anyway. Mm-hmm. So it takes a while in terms of like equipment is part of the fun. At least the the Numenera objects you get, like the oddities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so some games like uh, Fate, I know, uh, don't tend to, or at least in my experience don't tend to care as much about like equipment or what weird object you have, right? It's it's existing at a different level than like the tangible stuff in your pocket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Numenera cares about the stuff in your pocket, but makes it really weird. And that's why yeah. I care about it. And now <laughs> I am also very invested in that weird wand that keeps insects away and how can I MacGyver it? So <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it's absolutely. interesting because you do need all of those tiny details like you yes. do in D&D, but unlike D&D, they're not tied to numbers. They're tied mm-hmm. to That's a great way pieces. to put it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 very much a blend of like the crunchiness and like uh staticness of D&D mm-hmm. and the the malleability of PBTA. Yeah. I think yeah. that's right. Okay. Strong agree. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm have, like, I feel like up. we I don't have anything else to I say. I would love to have like, I feel like I could have an episode about this in like detail, uh-huh. right? I think I love uh, Cypher Speak is the podcast that I've run with Troy Pitchelman. Mm-hmm. And we do uh, a number of our episodes have focused on like how the Cypher system, which powers Numenera and was, is where the Cypher system originated, like how we compare it to some other different kind of systems, right? Like Savage mm-hmm. Worlds and... Um, yeah, you know, I think we've done a number of system comparisons, and I always find that really fruitful and interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think anyone who's going to – I feel like uh, the character creation system for this, uh, you know, I think it, it requires a person to take a little more time. If you, if, you don't, if you aren't interested in spending more time than you would in, like, a PBTA game, then you probably want to grab a pregen, of which there are many for free online. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And then you can customize from there, so. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> And I I like the um how weapons are just like there's three tiers, mechanically they all do the same thing, but what sort of flavor do you want to give to it? Yeah, and like uh, my roommate John Harness and I constantly talk about how what we're really looking for in games is dress up, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> We just like, we want to look real cool and mm-hmm. we want to have like cool stuff that matters absolutely in not no sense mechanically. <laughs> um, and Numenera is uh, really asks you to like, you know, even all the ciphers, like they stop block out all the little like one shot magic items for ciphers, but they give you like these options, right? Like, hey, if you want this one to be a wearable device, it's like mm-hmm. a cool headband. But if you want it to be in it, you know, an internal device it could be like something you swallow or like an injector Mm -hmm. and so i think it as we're doing the character creation part of that is sort of selecting your ciphers and it's teaching you like go flavor your stuff how you want right yeah Yeah. you know i really love that (laughs) that's really cool so do the mechanics of character creation here reinforce the feel of numenera it's such an interesting question, and I I would like I I'm really excited to hear your two responses to this too. Um, I I think the ways in which it reinforces like the feel of Numenera is that there are a lot of open blanks right for mm-hmm. you to write in right. There's no defined skill list. Um, there's like you know these background options that you're asked to sort of pick from or make make up on your own like how did you meet your pals what's what's a cool thing about your backstory how did you link to the starting adventure Mm -hmm. and i think that like those asking the player to fill in the blanks in you know without giving them like a list really says i i don't know i think it starts to signal to a player that Numenera is a world where kind of anything is possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're you're about to enter a really fantastical place. And I think it also prepares you for like curiosity and discovery and like picking some interesting, juicy choices that you'll figure out how to like 
weave together later, right? Like, Mm -hmm. unlike um, games that have a defined skill list, you're not like when you, you know, I I think about Gumshoe a lot and um, I think it shares some with with the Cypher system as well. But Gumshoe often has like a very, it has an extremely defined skill list. And like you, I, if you have a, a point in a skill, it makes you, uh, like you, any clues related to that skill as you're investigating, you would automatically get, and you can spend from mm. points and stuff. But if you don't take archaeology, um, you're not going to know the, the clue for archaeology because Numenera has this like mm. really fluid skill list. It's asking you to come up with unusual solutions and I think it's really empowering to be like no I can I can look at my character sheet and um, make arguments for why x or y makes sense or I'm going to try this weird way to bring these skills together or what if I could do this yeah. I think it really encourages that um, creative problem solving really early on absolutely yeah I would agree with that I think um, the fact that it's open um and this kind of goes into our next question, which is mm. how does the process of character creation set a player's expectations for playing the game? But I think there were a lot of things that I as a player had to like have input on and say like this decision that I make now determines something about this world. Totally. That um, it tells me and sort of signals to me that during the game, I'm going to have a lot of those kinds of choices too mm-hmm. um, because mm-hmm. things were left open. And it was like, I could say, you know, this new this piece of Numenera or whatever this like I I decide what that looks like and so that tells me something about the world that we're in Um, yeah and tells the GM and the other players right and we talked about player Mm -hmm. intrusions and things like that too um it tells me that I sort of have a lot of agency over what this looks like Mm -hmm. it's very like um what's the word I want to it's like a, a hidden collaborative world building sort of thing it, it kind of it kind of sneaks right. up on you yeah uh, it's it it feels like you are making these decisions that are building this world like when you think of the, the ninth world a billion years in the future eight prior civilizations <laughs> risen and fallen and now you're in this ninth one figuring out what that means and where the layers are all sitting um you're kind of building the past as well as the present yeah. Um, by these ciphers like okay well yeah I've got this cool cipher it does this thing and it looks like this what civilization was that from you've asserted you know? a fact about somebody that existed before right like exactly mm-hmm. somebody yeah. made this um, I'm really glad you said it that way uh, I think that um, there are a lot of choices to make in character creation for for this um, and I I think I hadn't I hadn't put my finger on why it is still really satisfying and worth going through and making all those cha- choices. And I think you're right. It is like uh, the collaborative world building is subtly woven through this. And so it does yeah. take a while. But man, do you, I ever feel really ready to like run a game for these characters by the end of it, right? Like yeah. we've established some really cool arcs. We, you know, we know there's a city that we have this tailor in. We've mm-hmm. got these really weird ciphers that we would go on to describe. And you've got a series of mysterious occurrences to investigate. Mm-hmm. Like... That's a lot of uh, campaign setup, world building that we've already kind of done as we build our yeah. characters. Yeah, and and children learning archaeology and about the past is yeah. an important factor in this world, apparently. Yeah, oh, I love it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think too, it's um, the way that you have like the descriptor and the type, and the way that those things are really broad. Um, yeah sort of gives you the idea that things are are going to be kind of fluid and negotiable yes um because we talked about like being able to flavor the things the way that you want to and talked mm-hmm. about like skills being kind of open like that like doors yeah um, <laughs> and you know it it tells me that as a player i'm going to have a lot of agency in those choices mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that um that the GM is going to be taking a lot of cues from the things that I've already established that like by mm-hmm. the time we get to the game, I've already told the GM like, here are the things that are interesting to me. And the yeah. thing, like there's all these strings to pull on already. Yeah. I think that's such a good point. Uh, I love the, the character sentence. Um, and I think one of the perks of having a character sentence. So having, you know, a one sentence summary of what your character is good at and does and what their shtick is, you know, kind of like fate aspects do, right? Your main aspect mm-hmm. should be kind of your big shtick. 
Uh, I think that sentence is is useful for a lot of ways, for, for a lot of reasons. But one of them is also like it's asking you to uh, continue to stop thinking about your character as an assemblage of stats and options and remember that they all come from this character sentence. And so I don't know. I think there's a number of ways that Cypher and Numenera point you back to the narrative, even though you might have to dip into mechanics. Uh, you may need to dip into mechanics to adjudicate something. It is reminding you to come back to the conversation at the table. Mm -hmm. um, Monty talks a lot about how he really likes to design around having really interesting conversation at the table. And he's like, that. that is like the meat of RPGs. It's like, what are yeah. we saying to each other or silently communicating to each other, even if it's a game with no you know, voices. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Cypher points you back to that rich conversation with things like the character sentence and with things like not a defined skill list, right? You're, mm. you're trying to say, oh, I took this, you know, I took a skill in, uh, in tailoring. And so I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you why tailoring makes sense here and what yeah. I remember from my tailoring days <laughs> and why that's going to help me create this weird solar sail thing that we're going to use mm -hmm. to sail across the chasm <laughs> as long as i can parkour at some point <laughs> you're gonna parkour you're gonna use that skill all day long come on it's gonna be amazing <laughs> any excuse to use yeah i gotta go a block all right i'm gonna parkour over that <laughs> that building <laughs> yep yeah totally climb up that wall backflip over this thing yeah all right we're good to go and one of the funny things about numenera is like numenera is the word for you know, weird, mysterious technology of the ancient past. So it is, you know, you might call a strange singing metal beetle Numenera, right? It might be an oddity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to do anything. Your your bomb cipher is Numenera. Mm -hmm. That enormous floating obelisk off in the distance that we could probably climb someday, that's Numenera. So like the nanos understanding Numenera skill can probably be applied to like almost anything, you know, right. in many ways. And like, that's a feature, not a bug, right? People who are yeah. good at stuff are going to keep giving us interesting information. You're going to parkour and we're going to go find a cool new spot mm -hmm. to go explore. Exactly. Uh, the broadness can be really embraced in the system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, since we kind of covered that one question, I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? And uh, what are some of the best parts? Ooh, good question. Um, I think one of the flaws, or at least like drawbacks, even if it is is maybe worth the drawback, is that character creation, uh, it does take a while. And it's kind of, it can be a little uh, intimidating when you haven't played yet. And so, uh, you know, I think one thing that can be tough is like, you have these three pools, might speed and intellect, and, you know, you don't know, like, how hard the game is or how like punishing and so you, mm. you know it's hard to get a sense of like ooh, should i like distribute these all evenly should i go really hard in one and really low in another and they they start you off with reasonable starting values so you're never going to be like useless but mm -hmm. i always i'm always like intimidated by systems where i'm like oh i have to like allocate these points in this game and I've i don't never know played. what they're used for i know how often they're gonna matter or... exactly mm -hmm. so i think like that's it's a it's just a that's a hard part of it i think that's kind of a, a, a flaw um one of the other pieces that again is sort of like double-sided to me is um when you look at that character sheet right because these characters can be pretty asymmetric sometimes it isn't clear like where do you write this or that or like mm -hmm. where should i jot down this it's it's sort of open and like people use those character sheets pretty differently um mm -hmm. and you know, I think that's absolutely okay. But when you're first learning that system, sometimes you're like, uh, where is like, I have, I have proficiency in weapons. And like, you know, sometimes that doesn't matter to other characters, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're not going to be writing down. They don't have those proficiencies. They don't write that down somewhere. So there's not mm -hmm. like the little box that says weapon proficiency. And so that can be a little like disorienting. Um, I think once you've played or once you've used a pre-gen, you get a sense of it and it's okay. But that first time, it can be a little hard to find your bearings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. about you guys? What'd you find tough? Yeah, I think uh, probably the toughest thing was, uh, you know, figuring out the character sheet because it's deceptively simplistic. Yeah. At the same time. <laughs> um, 
which is interesting. The The first page is just kind of a summary of who you are and where you came from. And right. then the second page is uh, all the nitty gritty details. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to uh, wrap your mind around it at first because I played uh, Cypher System a couple times before, uh, but only those two times and both with pre-gens. Mm -hmm. So diving into the character creation itself was a little daunting at first. Yeah. Uh, because I was like, oh, there are so many options. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Um, and it, it also sounds like you could expand beyond those options mm -hmm. and pick whatever you think applies and then you have to make up what that means mechanically as well, mm -hmm. um, which makes sense. But um, when you get down to it, it, it's not as bad as it looks at first. Yeah. It's um, the, the standard character sheet. You, you'll see how it has kind of three columns on each side. Mm -hmm. It's meant to fold over into a little trifold. Which I find yeah, extremely it's like a charming. Pamphlet. It's a little pamphlet. Oh, that's and, lovely. You know, you'll note that like when it's folded up like that, it's got the character sentence on top and a spot for like an illustration or some notes or like little stickers or whatever. Yeah. It's got the backstory on the bottom and on like the back of the pamphlet, and you fold it open inside for that nitty gritty. And I think that's like another way that Numenera is reinforcing, like, you know play up your character sentence like you know trying to empower you to sort of yeah stick with the narrative and not feel like tied down to your mechanical um what mm -hmm. only what's on your character sheet yeah but, exactly yeah. it is it is uh compared to i i think you're absolutely right that like when you've just picked up a pre-gen they're really easy to use they're pretty easy to navigate there's just not yeah. too much there but it is quite a process getting you there right yes um so that's kind of a drawback. How about you, Amelia? Any any sticking points for you so far? Um, I think when we got into type and the fact that they were so different from each other. Yes. Yeah. Um, w it tripped me up a little bit because as we're trying to run through it together, mm -hmm. I'm like, where are you? Why doesn't mine look like that? Yeah. Like, I don't understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so that took me a minute to like go back and like as Ryan's talking about his skills and things, I'm like, where is he getting this from? Because I yeah, don't Yeah, you see start it. to calibrate. And yeah. so like I had to go look at what he's looking at and being like, oh, mine just doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think there is it's not like you make a character one time and you're like, now I know how to do this. Whereas like yeah, in PBTA, really like different. the first time we sat down to record our maths episode, I was like, somebody explain to me what on earth a playbook is. Yeah. Cause like everybody keeps saying playbook and I don't know what that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and then, like, once you've absorbed that, you can make any PBTA character you want because you've, mm -hmm. you've figured that out. And so this one's a little bit different that, like, having made one character, I'm not sure that I could go make a second one and be like, oh, I totally know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, there, would, there would at least be, different. like, a new piece, right? Right. There would yeah. be some new thing to go look at. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think now that I've created one myself, um, I, I feel like I have the tools to yeah. to deal with that mm -hmm. that there's going to be some differences especially mm -hmm. created them as a group here um but yeah it's it's it kind of uh, i'm kind of excited to create more characters now because of those differences because right. totally all the characters are a bit different and all the puzzle pieces although they look similar from afar there there's some intricacies within them that that mm -hmm. make them much more interesting yeah uh I know I've talked about like parts that I love throughout the episode, but like yeah. maybe if I had to pick one thing that I think is sort of the the best part of character creation, you know, I th I think it's that character sentence, right? Like there are a lot of like little details that you have to write down as a result of the descriptor type and focus, mm -hmm. but whenever I find myself, I find that a really good anchor, right? Like because I sometimes struggle to like embody a new character. I find that like having that character sentence is like a really grounding point for role play. It reminds me like what I built my character for theoretically. Um, and so I find that like sometimes when I have mechanically complex character sheets, I'm like lost in the options down in the mechanics. And that character sentence really helps me understand who I am, helps my other players remember what I'm about because they don't really need to know all the nitty gritty choices that I made. But if as long as they know my character sentence, they kind of can remember yeah. what my PC is supposed to be doing. So I mm -hmm. that's like my favorite part is the character sentence. You have that at the end. It totally rocks. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know that was nice to have to go back to Mm -hmm. as I was making choices to say, okay, like if I picked prepared, what would I, yeah, what would I have that would go along with this? Mm -hmm. Like, what what kind of choice would a prepared person make? Oh, cool. Um, And so that was really nice to kind of like anchor it because I I do get that sort of analysis paralysis when you have like too many choices and you're like, I don't know where to go, Mm -hmm. I don't know what to pick. Um, and to have that kind of anchor to go back to and say, okay, I'm prepared. I know that about myself. What would I do from there? Yeah, I, the character sentence for me uh, was probably one of the the most uh, interesting parts. It's, uh, again, uh, uh, this game has a lot of deceptively simple sort of stuff in it where it's it's really from the from the surface level it's like okay yeah it's just a sentence that has three words in it mm-hmm. and those three words mean something um but then you dive into the details of those words and it completely defines your character yeah right that world building that we ended up doing as a part of it mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah under yeah. the hood there's a lot more going on <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah and i i love how it kind of spills into that collaborative world building territory too um unintentionally uh, from our perspective mm-hmm. as creating the characters just like right. oh yeah i'm creating this thing oh and i'm creating this other thing oh ooh, wait that those those things add up yeah mm-hmm. and now, now we got some cool information about the society <laughs> and cool information about uh how others might view our group and all that sort of stuff uh, i guess uh you know character sentence is that's my absolute favorite my second favorite is the oddity because it's just like You know, it feeds into this, like, what is the world we live in? Mm -hmm. What are we interacting with? And it's, like, a cool, weird thing that, I don't know, often becomes kind of, like, emblematic or iconic to the character, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I got a lot of, like, role play ideas off of that. Um, And so I love, oddities are just, like, flavor-packed objects. And so I I love love the, like, the trinket table in D&D, too. Because you're like, why do I have this thing? What does this tell me about my character? Like, Uh why why am I carrying this, like, one sock around? Like, what? Why is this important to me? Why do I have it? Like when I can only carry so many things, why is this the thing I chose uh-huh. to take yeah. on this journey with me? Exactly. Like, it's it's so valuable for like one tiny little piece of mm-hmm. like I love that stuff about character creation too, is that like so many people put so much work into the stats and my skills yeah. and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And I'm always like, what's the one weird random trinket that I yeah. have? And like yes, why yes, yes. why I did it. I move that with me? four different houses yeah like, why is that the thing that i still keep packing in the box and not giving to goodwill mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> like, yeah yeah oh when when i saw that trinket table like troy my co-host uh, of cypher speak and i just like flipped a lid we were like it's oddities for D." yes <laughs> <laughs> like, we were so excited <laughs> uh-huh i i think when we were rolling for those uh in our D episode uh my character got a 12 volt ba- 12 volt battery yeah. For his what? trinket. Yeah. Yeah. It was like described as this like uh boxy thing with two cylindrical tops oh, and like s- like that. tingled when it when you put it to your tongue or something like that. Yes. And it's like that's a twelve volt battery. It just blew my mind. Yeah. Like there's th- definitely Easter eggs in Numenera as well that are like things from maybe our world that you might be able mm-hmm. to recognize. I like love like it. buckyballs. Yeah, exactly. Which which I own a few and are completely out of reach of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, how do you think the mix of sci-fi and fantasy affects the kinds of characters that people play in these games? So I think that the the combo of science and fantasy and just Numenera in general, it creates some really weird characters, as I'm sure you can see from some of those mm-hmm. like really strange focus options. Um, you know, you get like just some of the weirdest PCs I've ever gotten to play with. But I also like that, you know, you have this sort of its own thing, science fantasy genre. And then on each side, you have like more pure, quote unquote, like fantasy and sci-fi. And because you have these kind of three different uh, like circles that your characters can find themselves in in, in this Venn diagram, like players who are like overwhelmed by being too weird can like maybe they're more comfortable with like sort of a fantasy character they can Mm -hmm. absolutely play a straight up fantasy character that doesn't want to deal with like your technological you know nonsense and it's just (laughs) like a big paladin with a cool sword right Mm -hmm. they're big lave um i've had characters play that alongside like 
uh, a character who basically died and became incorporeal and was just an animated like hand for a while and over the course of a campaign like slowly assembled more body parts right so that was like playing next to like the fighter (laughs) (laughs) who had a pet right like their focus was like has a cool pet it was great like control controls beasts or something commands beasts Mm -hmm. and uh and then you've also got like super sci-fi right like especially with the introduction of cool like vehicles and vehicle related like movement and chase scenes and stuff that Numenera mm-hmm. Destiny brought like you could play your hotshot pilot right you know your mm-hmm. Poe Dameron you know there's Numenera in space is one of the supplements mm. it's not called that it's called a better name <laughs> into the night but Numenera it's in space. it's space it's so great though and so I think I think one of the things it produces uh is that uh different players can kind of find their comfort zones in those different realms. I think that the mishmash of genres um, is a, it's a setting built to support the, the mm. combination of those genres. And so you get – players can feel find something that really works for them, even if they're really different, and they all mm-hmm. work together. That's, that's sort of what I've seen. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> that's so oh. weird. <laughs> <laughs> it – when you were talking about the the setting and everything, um, it made me really curious if uh, you could travel to another world somehow through magic or technology and find maybe a previous civilization. Uh, anything is possible uh, yeah. in the ninth world. It's wild. Yeah, there's um the the book that's just about to come out is called Voices of the Data Sphere, which I haven't even plugged because I'm bad at that apparently i'm just so excited about (laughs) numenera i can't you know i'm just very focused um but voices of the data sphere is uh one of our new books that introduces uh and lets you explore the data sphere which is kind of like the ninth world internet or what's Mm. left of it or maybe multiple internets but um Mm. in the previous books it's like a thing that you can maybe like get a weird cryptic answer from right so it's sort of like an ask google or ask alexa suddenly you have like a weird rich piece of you know an answer to one of your questions or like Mm -hmm. a cool asset towards something but voices of the data sphere is like what if tron but numenera it's like writing yourself into the data sphere and going into these realms of Mm. you know light and information and possibly like traveling to other places in the ninth world or i don't have the book so i Mm -hmm. can't tell you if this is a spoiler or not but i don't see why it's I feel like the data sphere could bring you to different times. Yeah. I feel like it could bring you to oh. different worlds and all kinds of stuff, right? So ah. I think that's absolutely campaign goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to play this so bad. I uh, know. Please play it with me. It's like a voice <laughs> of the data sphere. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, well, in lieu of playing today, uh, I think it's time that we uh, figure out what happens with these particular characters uh, in our fan fiction portion of the show yes 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 please (laughs) awesome so okay so we've got these three amazing characters have been friends for a while um and i come back with uh on on my mysterious quest of sorts yeah uh and rope both of you into my shenanigans (laughs) absolutely so Something mysterious happened and then you come back? Is that I th- I think there was like some there was something that I was following that was kind of mysterious. Maybe I uncovered something in, in one of the runes that I was uh uh delving into. Mm-hmm. Uh and and maybe that maybe searching for answers for this thing that I found led me to discover something a little weird and Ooh. a little mysterious that led to more questions that led to more questions uh and and every question i answered led to even more that eventually brought me back to the both of you cool i can i can see that being really compelling yeah um, so are you like back home like okay i have to just start over from the bottom because now i have question upon question upon question or mm-hmm. are you like following the trail and the trail has led here i want to say the trail led here cool yeah very cool and i i don't know if the trail directly involved either of you but it could be interesting if it was something from our past uh darcy yeah i like that a lot um 
one question I have for us is, uh, Ursula, have you, did you also grow up in this town or did you come from elsewhere? Like, is your, is your howls at the moon ability like a recent thing or is it something you've had for kind of a long time? Ooh, um, I think it's something I've had for a long time, but it's recently gotten worse. Cool. Okay. Mm. I like that. Um, yeah, I like I'm wondering if there's like, so you kind of educate, you've, you've like educated kids, right? You sort of like, mm-hmm. or, or given lectures or workshops of some sort. Yeah. I'm wondering if like we shared uh, maybe like a mentor or something in the city. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm trying to figure out how to weave all this together. <laughs> there's a lot of I know, and some of it, it's like, we would figure it out if we were playing. I know, uh. I know. Um, uh. One of the big organizations that, is uh, across the ninth world, or at least the steadfast sort of where you often start out, is the Order of Truth. It's mm. the Aeon priests. It's like the tech wizards, right? They're they're sort of uh, scientists slash like kind of religious figures, mm-hmm. um, and they're like very politically powerful. And so often, like you know, you know, if if uh, if an intrigue goes all the way to the top, then it's yeah. maybe involving like <laughs> some Aeon priests, which could mm-hmm. be fun. So, um, yeah, I like the idea that like something's gotten worse for your howls at the moon, and uh, you know, is like are strange like illnesses or like tech Numenera going haywire starting to like happen across the city, and so maybe the three mm-hmm. of us need to like. Uh, team up to sort of mitigate it here but like mm-hmm. what root caused it or who started it it could be kind of a question we start to follow mm-hmm. i could see kind of um this path leading towards needing to uh go to a specific like uh kind of runes of yeah. some sort yeah and uh getting through these runes uh would require all three of our skill sets oh cool yeah, so I can imagine a session where we're like kind of information gathering and then we sort mm-hmm. of like find the way to these ruins and somehow, you know, maybe Amelia Ursula's scan ability, right, can maybe scan mm-hmm. some areas that are getting like really haywired and you start to like triangulate where like the disruption's coming from. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think this definitely leads us to a ruin. What kind of ruin do we think it is? Mm. We've got a lot of like a lot of Numenera's aesthetic is like weird floating stuff or it could be like deep under the ocean or mm-hmm. you know on on the back of a, a moving animal or big structure it could be behind a brick in a simple wall but it leads to a whole other realm hmm. i like the idea that it's a cave in this mountain that is not made of rock oh hmm. i love it uh what color is it Ooh, um i think it's blue i love it Ugh. <laughs> so it like looks like every other mountain like in a mountain range but yeah. it's like this one particular peak that is not mm. made of the same like and we don't know what it's made of but it's That's not rock awesome is it, is it uh artificial we don't know oh yeah no maybe theories that's abound of, maybe that's part of the mystery <laughs> mm-hmm. cool uh so yeah i love the idea that maybe we were like we go and have to explore this ruin um you know, maybe we find out a little more about like what's up with your Howls at the Moon thing. Um, do you think you were chasing a person or just like clues? Um, your character, Selena, do you think she was like hunting down like a group of people that like maybe caused mm. this or is it, um, you know, sort of hard to tell? Is it just a whim of the strange Numenera around us? Yeah, I think it was um, originally a strain of um, clues. That cool. she was following. And then eventually the clues were pointing towards a more intelligent uh, mind behind cool. what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's it's it's ambiguous whether it's a uh, a living or artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah. Ugh. Um, I would really want to take us potentially uh, to perhaps as part of like a longer campaign to a place called the Wheel of Baz, W-E-A-L. It is like um, a whole cool community of like automatons and like machine intelligences that kind of Mm. form a refuge and a little community together. It's 
really cool. And so oh, I'm, I'm you know, if it is a machine intelligence or something, maybe we like trace it all the way over there. Yeah, I guess one question I would have for you two is like if we were following these three characters, do we think we'd want to engage more with like the having a home base community side? Do you think we'd want to like venture out and still have the city of our home be our home? Or like do you think we strike out and have to go very far away and um, don't really have like a home base or a place we keep coming back to? I I love the idea of having a home base. Mm -hmm, um, me too. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say uh, the city that we are uh, originating from, uh, not a very big city. Yeah. Like a, a tight-knit community of sorts. Oh, um, cool. Maybe less than a thousand people. Yeah. Um, and something where where everything kind of matters, right? Yeah, every little bit counts. Because mm -hmm. you don't have like a lot of redundancy when you have that few of people. Yep, right. So like the the local restaurants are going to be more, uh, you know, important. The the local tailor is going to be the tailor. Yeah, in yeah, town. yeah. Oh, um, that's so cool. And then building up that community and reinforcing the community and protecting that community, I can see that being really intriguing long term. Mm. And like, yeah, I mean, the, the three of us, right, like we, we had a childhood here, you know, Ursula like is like a really important part of like, you know, the like Taylor. Are you using like cool, weird Numenera tricks as you're like helping with weaves and stuff? Or are you like, well, I'm, I'm so curious about like, what specialty you you did in the weaving like are you still part of the tailoring or are you like branching out on like, your own now i feel like yes because i think we talked about you doing some of that too. Yes. You know, like the idea yeah. that we're doing that together that like we've sort of like we now specialize in this like weird is it like form of tailoring our shop that, like is it like oh that would be really cute it has like, to oh, be it has i love to be. it cool yes. this is really neat I love it. Um, there's a bunch of really cool uh, – one thing I really like about the way that Numenera's map is set up is there's a, a bunch of, like, areas that um, are kind of described for you and often, like, are presented in a really, like, easy to grab as a GM and, mm -hmm. like, riff off of manner. So there's often, like – like, if you go to the Sea Kingdom of Gaon, there's mm -hmm. the City of Bridges, which is a place we could be. Mm -hmm. And there's a little sidebar that's, like – gone hearsay so like cool rumors in the area stuff like mm. that but there's also a bunch of places on the map that are like little weird squares that are like a little um faded and mm. those are like sites on the map where like a cool thing is but mcg will never tell you what it is so it's like yeah. here here's a great spot to like jot in on your map our mm -hmm. town if we wanted to make it right mm -hmm. or like that cool weird blue mountain range ruin Mm -hmm. I bet that's in the Black Riage, and we can just pick one of those little squares and make it ours. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm so I, curious about our town. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I can see like this uh, mystery going cold at some point. Yes, and then oh, that's we're so like, smart. Well, we don't know what to do now. We hit a dead end. Yeah. Um, what else could we do aside from work with the community and and yeah. help help our hometown out? And then um, getting into like, well, I want an excuse for us to dungeon delve still, yes. right? Because mm, of course. that's kind of all my character is about. <laughs> um, so maybe I, I drag the two of you to look for materials, yeah, for for tailoring. Oh, um, to make it like super a super unique tailoring. Like, mm. not only are we the only tailors in town, but like we're starting to gain renown regionally. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I wonder if there's like a legendary, like a legend of our town of like this, I don't know, like important figure who like saved the town from some like intense danger. Like there's a mm -hmm. maybe a prophecy, who knows if we want to throw some fantasy in. Uh, but like, you know, this figure had like an amazing mantle with like mystical properties or like, I wonder if there's something that like, you know, the three of us are trying to recreate or find um, mm -hmm. some, yeah. like, thing that we think would really help us Ooh. or help the town. I want to throw something a little weird at that, too. Oh, dude. Okay. That's... Do it. Do um, it. <laughs> us, us figuring out how to create this mantle yeah. leads to uh, figuring out that 
the mystery is a way to send this mantle back in time. Oh, cool. So we oh, have to so create the mantle. we created the legendary thing, but like, it's <gasps> yes, from before. Yes, time, oh. timey-wimey nonsense is perfect. <laughs> oh, I love I'm it. I'm here for it. Uh-huh. Uh, but what goes wrong? Everything, Ooh. we we go through many sessions of amazing adventure. We find incredible technology and new friends and NPCs. And maybe our village is even getting a little bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, cool things we've built for it. Uh and we're finally ready. We have to send this mantle back. I, I feel like there's some complication or, you know, is the mantle sentient or something? Like what what complicates or do we get sent back? You know, it's a classic. Oh. Or part of us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hmm. Or do we leave on a dramatic cliffhanger, <laughs> you know, as that campaign find out. Yeah. comes into a <laughs> season close? <laughs> Oh, I yeah, love it. there there could be a lot of interesting complications for something like that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like whatever the complication is, it has to involve a terribly heartbreaking decision. It mm-hmm. does. Yeah, yeah. I bet, like, if we knew more about the NPCs that we've become very attached to, I bet that yes. has something to do with it somehow. If, it, if this was a campaign ending yeah. complication, I would say we have to send it back in order for all of this working, but only one of us can go with it. Ugh. And one of us has to go oh, with it. Oh, just Ugh. twist that uh, secret dagger of yours hidden up your sleeve. <laughs> just twist it into us. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Which one of us would do it? Ooh. I think there's a there's there's three alternate endings to this campaign. There is. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a choose your own adventure. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's so oh. sad in any case because we're so interconnected, you know? Yeah. yeah. It would be really brutal for any of us to... Oh. Uh, I guess we'll never know. No, nope. <laughs> I love it. I'm whoever gets sent back like leaves a message though that the other two find, right? Because they can go oh. back in time and scrawl in an ancient rock. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, so yeah, whoever goes back scrawls in an ancient rock, which is the mystery that Ryan <gasps> discovers eventually. Oh, Amelia, what? get <laughs> out! It leads him to go on this quest to make it in the first oh, place. Oh my god, right? we've closed the loop. <laughs> We did it. <laughs> Everyone take a long lunch. <laughs> oh, this is yes. amazing. Oh, I love it so much. Oh, wow. I'm like, All yeah, right. I'm very overwhelmed. It's so good. Okay. <laughs> oh, hot dang. Oh, what a good game that we didn't what play. What a good game we didn't play. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my heart. All right. Well, finally, let's yes. get into the last segment of our show. Um, it's our advancement discussion where we take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. All right. In this segment, we will cover character advancement and growth in the system. Uh, so how do we think uh, characters change as people within the narrative of the game? Is this uh, generally characters or our character, our characters? Our characters, yeah. Oh, perfect. Or or, or characters. Gen- I think general. it's either more. Way. Yeah, it's the you know. So here's my general statement, and then we can yes. get into our characters. My general yeah. statement is um, there are a lot of different valid paths to character advancement in Numenera. So that same XP that you get by allowing me to complicate your life as a GM with the GM intrusions. Or through uh, gaining through discovery. So when you discover things, you get XP. Uh, And that's a very vague term and intended to be Mm -hmm. because lots of campaigns will look very different. And so (laughs) what discovery means to your group might look different than others. Um, And you also can get XP for, you know, setting up goals, like narrative goals for your character and sort of pursuing along them. So I'm imagining, you know, Ryan's character, uh, Celine, would be, uh, getting some XP every time she finds like a little more clue to you know to mm-hmm. push this along. Um, I might find XP for uh, finding a cool relevant passage in a book about like that um, you know that mantle that uh, that we were searching for. Mm-hmm. Um, and Amelia's character might find other cool tailor related discoveries or discoveries about like how to master. Um, her like beast form and stuff so as you collect this xp you can spend it to you know re-roll to play your intrusion so you have these sort of short-term spends and then you also can spend it to advance your character like uh, gaining new skills uh, gaining new abilities 
uh, upgrading like your focus, upgrading, you know, your type. So characters have tiers in in Cypher system. And so you have six tiers and you basically need to do four different things, uh, four different kinds of advancements to get to the next tier. So you have to increase your effort, right? You can spend more effort, increase an edge. So that discount you get to pool spends. And then like two other things of which there are many choices. So uh, you can also do stuff like I could not advance my character and I could just buy skills for four XP each all day long. I could just be a tier one character that would still be perfectly functional in your group. Mm -hmm. Uh, Although maybe, you know, sad that I can't spend six levels of effort, but I could have (laughs) so many skills. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining that my character, like I would want to get a little better at illusions. Um, I would definitely want to get like cooler as a tailor. Um, And I would want to like, you know, spend a lot of time becoming really good with the community. So I could imagine like, you know, I don't really have any social skills right now, but I can imagine as we become more important leaders to the community, I might want to invest some in that. Like I would love Mm -hmm. to see my character, you know, I'm imagining my delve is like, is very nurturing, a very nurturing right, but like maybe doesn't know how to like extend themselves or like kind of reach out to people I'm sort of like maybe I kind of like lean on the nano or like my childhood friend to kind of like help draw me out of my shell a Mm. little but I would love to see some growth in like the ability to comfort people Mm -hmm. and like maybe persuade and lead and inspire I would like to see that kind of grow over time yeah what about you folks yeah I mean I definitely want to spend some time I think like figuring out and coming to terms with this beast form yeah i think that's definitely. kind of the arc that i'm interested I'm, in like at least personally right trying to figure out like what's up with that why mm-hmm. is that how do i control that yeah um how do you feel about it you know right yeah mm-hmm. like why why don't want to eat my friends yeah. <laughs> how do i not eat my friends exactly <laughs> That's a question we should all be asking. That we should all be yes. asking ourselves. You know? <laughs> How can I stop eating my friends? Uh-huh. I love it. <laughs> um, and then oh, for myself. Oh, yeah, I have a question ahead. about your beast form. Does your beast Ooh. form change over time? Like if you still have your beast form, like does the cool like bear personality start to grow and change? Well, so like I said, I think that it's recently gotten worse. Right. So I think that it started out as like either like not a full transformation oh, or cool. like it was an adorable small bear mm. um, <laughs> oh my god something yes. like this so, like it's it's gotten worse in that like yeah you know Violent like it probably and, right yeah. didn't used to be bloodthirsty and cool. carnivorous or mm. you know like that is a recent change oh i love that mm-hmm. yeah. and how about celine oh uh celine i believe um she wants to get both, uh, you know, better at traversing these runes, um, mm-hmm. so better physically and all that sort of stuff. Um, better at combat because I think that's like something that we are um, a little Sorely late lacking. On. Yeah, <laughs> and I think she just wants to be better at protecting her friends um, during these dangerous delves and whatnot because uh, she used to she's used to going solo. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe being a little bit more stealthy in that regards. Yeah. Uh, even though she's not skilled at that, but um, going with a group, I think she wants to get better at protecting. But also, like, um, the knowledge of the past, she wants to kind of increase the, like, her maybe gain some skills in, in understanding the Numenera better. Oh, neat. Which would be interesting. And that could be kind of, I can imagine cool scenes of like, you know, our, our learned nano, right, is like extremely knowledgeable yes. about Numenera. I have, can... a, I have a book about it ah. for my starting. <laughs> oh, I'm just imagining like really heartwarming, like how we share information with each other and what we learn from each other over time. That would be yeah. extremely charming. Yes. Yeah. There, uh, there is a lot of bonding opportunities in this party. Yeah, yes. definitely. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love oh. them. Me too. They're goods. What a good group. I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's that's pretty much it for advancement then, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think like there would be kind of advancement to be seen with the community, right? So communities mm-hmm. like start out as love like with levels and um, you know, they have uh the level sort of represents like what it takes for like big environmental disasters or like an army to like, mm. you know 
get through your walls. So um, I, you know, we haven't fleshed that out as a full character like we have, but I think over Mm -hmm. time we would also see our town mechanically and narratively kind of grow and flourish and change, Mm -hmm. which would be fun, really fun to see. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love that. (laughs) Awesome. Well, is there anything else that we want to say before we wrap things up? (sighs) No. I don't think good so. Kids. I like We're these good characters. I know. I know. They're very <laughs> wholesome. <laughs> I know. I love them. Uh, awesome. We got to play. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Darcy, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Numenera. So, so much fun. Oh, I had, an, I can't, you, you can see through the video that my cheeks have gone up to my eyes and I can't stop smiling. <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed this so thoroughly. This has Absolutely. been an absolute delight. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you online and what uh, sort of things you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find my uh, the work of my amazing team at Monty Cook Games at montycookgames.com or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Monty Cook Games. Um, my personal stuff, so weird snail facts, air plant enthusiasm, uh, my RPG exuberances is at Darcy L. Ross, D-A-R-C-Y-L-R-O-S-S. Um, upcoming stuff you should be looking forward to is uh, we have our uh, Voices of the Data Sphere, the cool new Tron meets Numenera supplement that I'm very hyped for. Um, <laughs> Arcana of the Ancients just came out and Beneath the Monolith is about to come out. Those are two products that are bringing the weirdness of the Ninth World and uh, and the setting of the Ninth World, respectively, to 5e. So if mm-hmm. you have a group that uh, really wants to stick with a comfortable rule set, um, but you are excited by like the weirdness of Numenera, you can come make weird Numenera characters mm-hmm. and play with a 5e rule set. So I'm really excited for that. Nice. And uh, Burn Bright is B R Y T E is a roll twenty based uh, RPG that I had a a small part in, but I'm very excited for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has lots of weird because I was helpful in designing it. And so uh, look forward to um, an RPG by Roll Twenty coming out this summer called Burn Bright. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see what that one has. Oh, it sounds gosh. interesting. Absolutely. It's kind of about it. I'm not saying you can romance a ship. But you can. <laughs> it's great. I am saying that. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. <laughs> well, Darcy, thank you for joining us. And thank you again to everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you, listeners. Mm-hmm. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Total Party Kill. Total Party Kill is a weekly live Twitch stream where John Patrick Cohen, Eddie Klinker, and James Dugan play through Cephalofair Games' Gloomhaven. Join them in the stream to play along through the action and interact with a constantly changing cast of characters and special guests. Or watch them after the fact on the OneShot YouTube channel. 
TPK airs Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time at twitch.tv slash one shot RPG.